the previous video, we discussed the resurgence of the ancient Greek civilization at the beginning of the Archaic period and after centuries of cultural decline. The forming of the city-states was mentioned briefly, but now we will get into much more detail as the rise of the Greek city-states or polis is a very important historical process. During the Greek Dark Ages, the population of ancient Greece was spread throughout numerous small isolated settlements. The people were largely occupied with farming and pastoralism. The leader of each settlement was called Basileus, which translates to king in ancient Greek, but he was nothing like the king that usually comes to mind. The Basileus was superior to the rest of the villagers, but his wealth was not much higher than any others. The Basileus would stand out and become the chief of the settlement because of his leadership skills or his fighting prowess, as many settlements often raided others to acquire more livestock. There were many cases where more than one Basileus ruled in one settlement, and there were thousands of villages across the mainland, the islands and Asia Minor, so there were thousands of Basileus as well. The Basileus, along with a council of elders, was in charge of keeping the settlement stable and he would try to resolve any serious problems or disputes the villagers had between them. The power of each man in the village resided with his oikos. Oikos is an ancient Greek word which translates to household, but family, land and property were also included in the word's meaning. The social standing and wealth of the oikos were very important. The same applied to the oikos of the Basileus, which he strengthened by having many children or by hiring people to work or fight for him whom he would later adopt into his family. The oikoi of the Basileus would be the first version of the noble families that later emerged in ancient Greece. As for the common people, they led rather simple lives, with the men either farming or tending to their livestock, and the women mainly taking care of the children while also performing many household tasks. A small percentage of men would also raid other villages or fight when their village was raided. Many villages were culturally tied to each other, mainly because of tribal affiliations, or because it was beneficial to have friendly relations with some of their neighbours. All these villages together comprised what the ancient Greeks called a demos, in which there were usually very good relations. But everything outside the demos was most of the time considered a hostile territory. This is one of the many reasons that the settlements remained isolated. During the late Dark Ages, around 900 to 800 BC, many things started to change. One of the fundamental changes of that period is that every oikos obtained a piece of land that was formally recognized as its private property. This piece of land was called Clarus. This was the first family farm in history and it changed many things as from then on there was certainty that an oikos could prosper and pass down the well to the future generations of the family. The family would also be willing to make different kinds of investments in order for their Clarus to prosper. Most of the people in the settlement now had a fair share of land and could now live off it. This, along with other factors, ignited a population growth which later brought problems as the farming land of each settlement was not enough for everyone to gain their own clerus. This in turn led to the expansion of many settlements in order to acquire more fertile land. At that time, in many households, there were two to three hired workers or slaves working in the oikos along with the family. The hired workers were usually free men with no land or free women who were widows. The slaves were usually individuals who were in great debt or had been captured in raids and were then enslaved, although the latter was a rare case. However, there was not a clear distinction in those times, as most of the workers and slaves worked and ate together with the head of the oikos. The expansion of the settlements many times brought quarrel with neighbouring settlements as they were competing for the same land. This many times resulted into full-scale battles, making the 8th century BC a century of contest for land in ancient Greece. During that time, the Basileus saw an opportunity to increase their power and influence and urged their people to acquire more land so that they would automatically control a larger territory and perhaps enhance their authority over the people. Many Basileus submitted to other Basileus while merging into the same family, so that despite the submission, they could retain a high status and some authority. This made the leading Basileus families increasingly powerful, which made them the primary nobles of each region. Thus, the authority of the region was slowly transferred from a Basileus or many Basileus to a single noble family or many noble families. 
the noble families would merge in order to acquire the best and largest land together with a great number of livestock. The wealth gap between the nobles and the common people grew relatively wider. Although there were now noble families throughout the history of ancient Greece, there were never formal distinctions between classes in the society and this made room for some opportunities, although rare, for common people to rise in the social scale. The fallout of a noble family though was much more frequent. To avoid this, many nobles would proclaim that they were descendants of a hero or a god in order for their families to always remain relevant and respected. The nobles would marry with other noble families to keep their lineage pure. The 8th century BC saw many developments in the forming of the city-states as many large settlements and their basileis expanded their territory. This was done in three different ways. The first one was by merging with other large settlements. The second was by absorbing smaller ones. The third and the most usual way was war. Settlements also went to war to acquire land that did not belong to anyone but was contested by neighboring settlements as well. They would also fight in order to subjugate and conquer their enemies. The second case was rare though and one of the few examples we have is Sparta's conquest of Messenia but we will talk about that in another episode. By the end of the 8th century BC, the map of ancient Greece would look almost the same as in the classical period regarding the Greek polis. The establishment of the clerus, the merging of many settlements, the formation of clear land boundaries and the rise of the noble families were all elements that contributed to the rise of the polis as the entity that we know today. The formation of the polis was a very slow process. It wasn't a coordinated plan that each settlement was trying to accomplish, but rather a result of all the changes and events that took place during the 9th and 8th centuries BC. The polis that formed in the 8th century BC was the type of polis that we see in the classical period as well. It was a socio-political structure, a collection of settlements with usually one major urban centre where the people would gather and discuss the predominant issues of the region. The polis was autonomous and most of the time self-sufficient. Each one of them developed its own unique culture, with its patron god or goddess celebrating its own festivals which were usually held to honour and worship these deities. The polis were quite small in size and there were plenty, numbering between 1000 and 1500 during their peak in the classical era. The urban centre of a polis was usually built upon a high hill or rock called the Acropolis, meaning edge of the polis, in which the most important administrative and religious buildings were located. Since the large majority of the people were farmers, their houses were built nearby their farming lands around the Acropolis. The Acropolis was usually surrounded by walls, so when the polis was attacked, the citizens would run and barricade themselves inside these walls. There were a few cases where walls were also built around the urban centre. Most of the time, the system of a polis would evolve naturally, but sometimes it was imitated by a neighbouring settlement after acknowledging its advantages over other governing systems. It is important to note that many regions in mainland Greece, especially the most mountainous ones, did not ever develop into polis or would make this transition much later in history. The form of society that these settlements had was called ethnos, which translates to nation tribe in ancient Greek. The ethnos was a unified region sharing the same customs and traditions and was usually led by a basileus or a council but had no urban centre or formal institutions. Most of the ethnoi were in the mountainous regions of Greece as the people there were more occupied with livestock and pastoralism rather than farming, so the changes that occurred in the farming communities did not affect them at all. On the other hand, many people with livestock in the farming settlements converted their pasture lands to farming lands so that they could acquire their own clerus or expand it. These farmers usually kept a small number of domestic animals, if any at all. Regarding the governmental structure of the early polis, the change from the basileus to the rule of the nobles was somewhat swift. The rule of the chieftain-like Basileus gave way to the complex and formal governmental system of the Protopolis, in which there were various governmental offices, the Council of Nobles, and usually the Bodhi or the People's Assembly. The offices were numerous, especially if the polis had a large population and filled all sorts of roles in order for the polis to function. The most prominent administrators of these offices were the polemarch, meaning war leader or war chief the Archon, who was the chief magistrate as well as the judicial officer, and the Basileus, retaining the reverence of the title but with drastically different tasks and authority. 
The Basileus was now in charge of religious rituals and would also perform judicial tasks. As was the case in the Dark Ages, there could be more than one Basileus at a time. Depending on the population of the polis, it could hold from 20 to 600 officers. The term for every office was usually one year. Having completed his term, an official would usually become a member of the Council of Nobles, which held most of the power in the government during those times. It is through this council that the first written laws in ancient Greece were established during the 7th century BC, confirming the shift from the rules of a settlement that were loosely based on cultural customs to the formal legal code of the polis. The newly created Greek alphabet greatly contributed to this process. The assembly of the people constituted of all the male adult citizens of the polis. The assembly was more of a discussion meeting, although it had some say in the government. However, its power diminished over time, as the nobles and the middle class became wealthier through land expansion and trade. There were some exceptions in the governmental constitution of the polis, the most notable one being Sparta, which retained the rule of two monarchs or basileis in power, but with a noble council as well. It must be noted that the adult men of the polis were the only citizens with fully legal rights. Women were considered citizens too, but they did not have the same rights under the law as men. The children came next, along with the slaves and the metikoi, who were the inhabitants that had migrated from another polis. The metikoi were not considered citizens, although they would acquire some rights over time. The notion that each man was to be treated the same under the law was the first concept of citizenship in history. The men were not subjects of a king or a tribal chief anymore, and they were not owned by anyone. This nation, along with the now established clerus, the local culture, its traditions and customs, as well as their religious cults, made the people very proud of their polis, and the community bonding was greatly enhanced. This gave rise to the local patriotism and originalism of the Greeks, as a man's polis would become part of his own personal identity. We notice in the writings of the 7th century BC that each man's highest concern was his polis rather than his oikos, and to die in battle for the polis was one of the most glorious deeds a man could do. To further strengthen the bond between the citizens of a polis, many nobles started building temples and altars in the countryside to connect the people of the countryside with the urban centre through religion and culture in order to boost their sense of community. For example, Corinthians were not only the people who lived inside the city of Corinth, but also the people that lived in its surrounding countryside inside the polis territory. As we mentioned, at first the nobles were not so far off from the common people, and that is one of the reasons that they were able to rise in power. The common people did not oppose them because there were not really any major differences between them. Knowing that the nobles had the same problems with them was enough to accept their rule although this would change over time, as the nobles started exploiting the poorest chunk of the farmers. Some of these farmers could not sustain their oikos with their own small clerus, so they rented parts of the nobles' farmlands in return for a portion of the harvest. This did not prove to be beneficial, because if the weather was unfavourable and they could not produce the crops needed for the year, they would find themselves in debt. Periods of drought or heavy raining could considerably damage their rented land. Also, if the specific crop was not abundant, they would need to borrow seeds from a neighbouring oikos, which put them in even more debt. This forced a substantial part of these poor farmers to remain on the nobles' farms for all their lives in order to pay their debts, essentially making them thetis, which means hired workers in Greek, or sometimes effectively making them slaves. During the battles for land expansion between the polis in the 9th and 8th century BC, we see the first evidence of the famous Greek military formation called Phalanx. We will talk in detail about Greek warfare in a future episode. Nevertheless, the Phalanx and altogether warfare was a very important element of the ancient Greek polis, so we must examine it briefly in order to comprehend how the polis formed and developed. In short, the Phalanx was a military unit comprised of heavily armed foot soldiers called the Hoplites. The Hoplites wore a helmet, a breastplate and greaves, and carried a large circular bronze shield with a tight grip. They also carried a spear as their main weapon and had a short sword tied around their waist for backup. The whole armour was very heavy and the soldiers were engaged in hard work or athleticism in order to go to battle and carry so much weight while fighting. The phalanx always moved together with synchronised steps, and each soldier protected the one next to him with a shield while holding his spear up front, pointing it towards the enemy. 
There was also a backup army of light foot soldiers armed with javelins to harass the enemy and a few cavalry units to scatter them or cut them down if the enemy started to flee. The main military unit though was always the phalanx. The rise of the phalanx warfare goes hand to hand with the rise of the polis as the men had to fight for their polis to defend their land, family and community or to expand its territory in order to acquire more farming land. Fighting in the phalanx was considered a great feat and as we mentioned dying in battle for one's polis was considered a glorious deed. Meanwhile, during the 8th century BC, the Greeks started establishing colonies in southern Italy and later in the wider region of the Mediterranean, mainly because of land shortage. Despite the territorial expansion of the settlements, the problem of overpopulation remained. During this time, trade began to flourish and some people who were farmless or had a small infertile clerus took this chance to make a better living. Also, with the new farming techniques imported from the Near East, many farmers with a rather infertile but large clerus used these techniques to make their farms fertile so their wealth skyrocketed. This gave rise to a new social class which did not belong to the noble families but had acquired substantial wealth. This greatly affected the phalanx because the weapons had to be acquired by the hoplite himself and they were somewhat expensive. Now, the rising middle class could afford those weapons and would fight along with the noblemen in the phalanx. The poorer citizens were usually in the light infantry units or could not afford any armor or weapons at all, so they did not participate in the battles. This had a major effect on the polis. Many known noblemen who fought alongside the nobles started to question their rule regarding the governmental structure of the polis. While they technically had the same rights under the law, only the noblemen could participate in the government and occupy offices. Why should they, who were doing the greatest deed for their polis, not participate in the government? These men were essential to the polis because of their wealth and fighting force, so naturally they started demanding more rights. It is during this time that we see the rise of tyranny in ancient Greece, which we will analyze in depth in a future episode. But in short, since the phalanx was essentially the army of the polis and its power was rising, a nobleman would take advantage of that and earn the support of the hoplites, who in turn would make him the sole ruler of the polis. Tyranny has a bad connotation today, but in those times, a tyrant could prove more capable and efficient than the council of the noble families. The tyrants were many times favoured by the common people, hence the phalanx's willingness to support their uprising. There were instances where the tyrant would abuse his power for personal gain. However, the abuse of power was not easy for the tyrant, as the phalanx was always ready to overthrow him if they were displeased. The tyrants would usually make promises to the hoplites to treat the middle and lower classes fairly and make the polis function better. Tyranny was a common occurrence throughout the archaic period. The most significant change it brought was that when a tyrant was deposed, the government of the polis would change fundamentally. In many polis, the discontent of the middle class did not bring tyrants into power, but the pressure was too much for the nobles nonetheless, and so in most polis, the offices could now be held by wealthy people, regardless if they came from a noble family or not. This was the beginning of the ancient Greek oligarchy, which remained the most predominant type of government throughout the rest of the ancient Greek history. Although a form of prestige and elitism of the nobles would remain, the middle class entered the government, making it more representative. Now, a large part of the common citizens was together with the nobles, not only in war, but in governmental duties too, so the social mobility was easier than before. Although this happened in most of the polis, there were some exceptions of much more conservative societies that held on to the aristocracy of old. This depended on the middle class and the local culture of every polis. Despite the differences between the polis, the ancient Greeks developed a cultural bond and connection with each other, acknowledging that they all shared features which their neighboring civilizations did not. This can be observed through the common religious sanctuaries, the various alliances mainly between the Greek tribes and the Panhellenic festivals. Although there was a common Greek identity, this identity was split into the four tribes we talked about in the previous videos. The Dorians, the Ionians, the Aeolians and the Achaeans. There were usually good relations within a tribe, with some exceptions of course, but each tribe was wary of the other. This division was further enhanced with the local patriotism and unique culture of each polis. As a result, there were frequent, but most of the time, minor battles and hostile relations between many of the polis, as each one of them strived for dominance in the region. 
The notion of competition that made each polis try to outdo the other, build bigger and more beautiful temples, create a better organization and governance of their polis, as well as a better army, led to a massive growth of innovation, especially during the classical period. This competition, however, would also prove to be destructive on various occasions. The conversion of the simple settlements into the complex system of the polis was a long and drawn-out process that may have taken over 250 years to complete. It is crucial to understand the notion of the polis as it is one of, if not the most, substantial element of ancient Greek history. As most of the deeds that the ancient Greeks are known for today probably wouldn't be accomplished without the polis system.